Hi everyone, this is Zach Weiss, co-founder of Born and Wound, and today I'll be taking a look at the Tornek Ravel TR660 Series 3, uh, but I'll get back to that part later. If you find yourself saying uh, Tornek Whoville, don't worry, you're not alone. Tornek Ravel is not a household brand name. And the story starts in the 1960s, uh, something like this. So uh, Blancpain, which I know isn't the brand we're talking about, so bear with me, uh, beat out the Navy's, US Navy's tests for a military diver, beat out various other brands, brands you are likely very, very familiar with, and just kind of was the top dog for what they needed. A few years later, mid 60s or early to mid 60s, uh, Vietnam War is uh, occurring and the military needed that dive watch for their some of their elite squadrons, uh, teams that would later become, you know, the Navy SEALs. So there was a uh, bid for the contract and the one issue with the Blanc Pond, as you might be aware, is that they're Swiss. So because of the Buy American Act, of 1933, the Navy had to go with an American brand first if there was an option. So somehow, uh, a gentleman by the name of Alan V. Tornek, who was a Blanc Pan distributor based in New York, pitched basically a way to take Blanc Pans and essentially make them in America or make enough of the components in America, change the name on the dial for them to count, and won that contract. Uh, there's a little bit of like mystery about how that all happened. I mean, they beat out very well-known American brands such as Bulova for this contract. Um, but nevertheless, that is how Tornik Ravel was born. And Tornik being Alan V. Tornik's last name. And Ravel is actually a play on the word Villaray, which is where Blanc Pan is based. So it, it's, it's easy to kind of say uh, or overstate the simplicity that the Tornik Ravel was just a rebadged Blanc Pan 50 Fathoms. The reality is, is that it followed a very strict mil spec, MILW22176A if I'm correct. And that uh, had various other details in there, such as that it had to have a non-magnetic case, non-magnetic watch, frankly. So that means not that it was anti-magnetic, which you might be more familiar with, such as having a, a pilot's watch with a soft iron cage inside to protect the movement from magnetism. The watch itself could not carry a magnetic signature. Once again, there's some debates over why that is. So they had to go through kind of like, you know, a lot to make that happen. They had to change out movement components, the hairspring, just a lot of different things. So it was, it was really its own watch. And if you look at photos online uh, from forums of uh, Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms next to Tornik Ravel TR900s, which was the original watch, by the way, you'll notice that there are other visual changes as well. It really was not exactly the same thing. Which brings us to now. Tornik Ravel thus never made a civilian watch, and it's been owned for a handful of years by Bill Yao of Mark II Watches. In fact, in 2010, and the reason why this is Series 3, he actually made a very, very, very small batch of watches that did say Tornik Ravel on them. And to pay respect for to that batch of watches, this is now Series 3 rather than Series 2. But there's literally like 10 of those, so don't go looking for them. The TR660 and the relaunch of Tornik Ravel is then really kind of meant to reestablish the brand, or frankly establish it in the first place, based on kind of the spirit of what the TR900, as according to Bill Yao, and I've talked to him about this, you know, really was. This wasn't a luxury watch like you might associate with Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms. This was a tool watch. It was a military watch. It was issued to people from all walks of life. You know, it wasn't just this kind of like elite luxury timepiece. So the TR660, it's designed to be obtainable. To quote Bill in my conversation with him, it's only as expensive as it needed to be. So the starting price on this is $895, goes up to around $950, and that's really just for a different strap option. What's powering this watch is a Seiko NE15 caliber, so it's a Japanese movement. It's a Japanese-made watch. You know, I think there was a little bit of a, of a reaction to that when it first came out because, you know, the originals were either Swiss or American-made. If you know Bill Yao, you know Mark II's work, as I think a lot of you probably do, you know that quality is sort of like the first and most important thing to that brand. Um, if anything, it sort of slows them down in terms of production. I'm pretty sure you still cannot get a Paradive at this moment, so sorry, Bill. And then the TR660, so what is this watch? Well, it's sort of a new concept for the brand. It's taking this old idea, but it's making a sort of a new watch out of it. It's sort of a military history lifestyle brand in this new brand, Tornik Ravel. In addition to the watch, you can also find a really cool mug called the Bombs Away mug, which was inspired by the sort of mugs I believe they used to drink from in World War II. So it's sort of this cultural brand. That might sound weird, but look at your clothing. You have desert boots on, you have 
epaulets on your shoulders. You have M42 jackets in your in your closet. You know, these are all pieces of essentially military history that have made their way into culture and it's just, uh, you know, fashion and accessories. So the TR660, uh, I'd say pays close respect to the TR900, but also takes some liberties as well. Starting with the case size, it is 40 millimeters in diameter by 48.5 millimeters lug to lug and about 14.7 millimeters thick. And that includes a uh, dome sapphire crystal. That is actually, from what I can tell, a little bit smaller than the TR900, which I believe came in at 41 millimeters and was a little bit longer lug to lug. That is incredible. I think we should all thank Bill for bringing a watch that is uh, a little bit smaller even than its uh, historical counterpart because usually it goes the opposite way. Some other inclusions from Bill, uh, you know, in this design that were not found in the TR900. Something actually that's interesting is he curves the case back and that adds a little bit of thickness to the to the watch overall. But that is a design feature that uh, Bill Yao includes on various other watches. Um, for comfort, really. The idea being that a bowl shape sits better into the wrist than a flat uh, case back does. So there's a little bit of like an ergonomic consideration there. The lugs. So these are drilled lugs on this watch. The original had welded in lugs, uh, fixed lug bars. Uh, that is, you know, I think a very smart thing to change. Uh, sorry, Tudor. But um, the reality is for changing straps, for putting on, you know, leather straps and a multitude of different types of straps, you're gonna wanna have uh, you know, uh, removable spring bars. And this watch actually comes with two sets of spring bars, which is quite unique. There's a thick set, which is about 2.8 millimeters thick. The idea being that you use those with pass-through straps. They create like more of a sort of a substantial body there. And then 1.8 millimeter straps, which are kind of more, or 1.8 millimeter spring bars, which are your more typical size spring bars, and that you use with a leather strap, and that creates a little bit more room around the lug. So another element that uh, Bill Yao changed on this watch, which I think was a, a definitely a positive change, uh, from the TR900 is the crown itself. So if you look at photos of TR900, you might notice the crown actually looks a bit puny. Here, they really went for the robust option. So it's a screw down crown, so it's seven millimeters in width and it stands off the case a bit. But what's interesting about it is that it actually also goes into the case. So when you screw that crown in, it sits within a recess in the case, which provides sort of some, some structure to it and a little bit of extra durability, a little bit of protection from any kind of hitting from the side rather than adding crown guards, which would have really changed the look of the watch. So we just get a really solid crown, which I uh, don't think anybody is going to complain with. The bezel here is a 120 click unidirectional bezel, as you would expect. It has a, a fairly nice mechanism. This isn't one of those mechanisms that really like loudly pops and like clicks into place. It's more kind of slides in. It's a reassuring slide, um, but you know, I think compared to other uh, bezels where you might be like looking for that really satisfying, like clean stop. This isn't quite that style. This is a little bit more of a, of a kind of a slick maneuver. Um, still satisfying and, you know, my experience with the watch, you know, didn't really, you know, move when I didn't want it to or anything like that. The insert is kind of more interesting. So you actually have two options for inserts. There's the acrylic insert you see here. Then there's an aluminum insert option, which would have given the watch a much more kind of contemporary feel, I think, and which is kind of an interesting thing. And then it's interesting also that he leaves that decision up to you. This definitely gives it that vintage look. Originally, the bezel was probably bake light. What is really nice about this though is the execution. The loomed markers are milled in really deep. So if you look at this from an angle, you can actually see the sides of those markers, particularly on the numbers, which is just like a beautiful effect. There's a lot of depth to it. That acrylic bezel then leads directly to a domed sapphire crystal, which certainly wouldn't have been on the original. You don't have an option there, but it is a very well executed crystal. And I think they actually made a good choice of keeping it a more of a simple dome rather than a box shape because you have clarity across the entirety of the dial, which I personally really like, especially on this kind of smaller uh, bezel size. So my one critique of this uh, case is also something I actually really like about it. And that is that it's a very severe and harsh design. You know, this is in some way staying very close to those original TR 900s, those original 50 fathoms. You have essentially just a slab sided watch. I mean, it comes up at a straight angle. It hits a 90 degree angle and turns to the bezel, which is completely flat. The lugs are fairly straight. It's not exactly like smooth. There's no bevels to it. It doesn't feel modern in any way. And I think that there's a little bit of a sort of a conflict, a little bit of a conceptual conflict here between what's new and what's old, what's meant to be updated and what's meant to be respectful of that original. On one hand, that gives it the aesthetic and it's very, very nice. It looks great. On the other hand, I don't think this is necessarily the best design for a modern dive watch. Um, 
but that's not necessarily what they're going for. So on, you get that kind of harshness, the kind of look of the original, but I think, and particularly on the wrist, as you'll see, you know, that might lead to not necessarily always the most comfortable experience. But like I said, I do like it. It's also beautifully bead blasted, which, you know, it was reference to the original, which would have been bead blasted, but this isn't a military watch anymore. And I think a brushed option would also be very welcome. Now let's take a look at the dial of the TR660. Uh, so as you'd imagine, things stay very kind of true to the TR900, but at the same time, there's some significant changes as well. But unlike in the case where I think there's been a lot of modern developments in the kind of ergonomics and design of designs of uh, dive cases in general, dive watch dials are pretty much the same. I mean, you have dots, bars, triangles, and that's it there's there you know the iconic watches of today look a lot like the iconic watches of the mid 60s and that includes the 50 fathoms and watches that are kind of based on it so you have a matte black dial with very very precisely printed circles and triangles you know the bars at cardinal mark the triangle at 12 dashes around the edge you know the precision of the printing here though it's it's common on a modern watch to have very high quality you know pad printing when you look at this compared to a tr900 which had like globbed on radioactive paint the difference is is very nice it's a very very crystal clear dial, just executed very well. For loom, they went with a white loom that glows green, so no Fotina here, which I think was a good choice. Uh, there are definitely watches sort of in this style that have been on the market for years that it go with sort of a, you know, that kind of ochre colored loom, faux radium kind of loom, and, and they just take it a little too far into, uh, you know, pastiche territory. This isn't meant to look like it's old, it just is styled based on a vintage watch. The text on the dial, I think, is a little bit more where there might be some contention. So you have Tornik Ravel US right below 12. That is basically identical to what it looked like on the TR900. It is, I think, the right choice for this watch because that's the kind of thing that I think those people who are buying this for its relationship to the TR900 would be upset to see change. But I also think that on a future versions of this watch or where the brand goes next, that there might be some more delicate choices that can be done there. Above six, however, is uh, probably kind of the weirder element that is on the dial. So there is a blind impression or just kind of a depression into the dial of a large circle and it's split in half, black on the top, gray on the bottom. In the top half, it says automatic and in the bottom half, it says 200 M. So that's obviously 200 meters and you know automatic things you'd find on you know many dive watches, but that circle itself is actually a reference to a moisture indicator, which would have been found on the TR900. It's part of the mil spec. I think it was a smart thing for them not to try and remake a moisture indicator in this watch. All it really tells you is that like some moisture, not necessarily water, but like vapor could have gone into the watch and then you need your dial replaced. Sounds like a headache. But the circle at one point, at one hand references it pretty clearly. And at the other hand, doesn't necessarily serve a, a real function. And I think had that moisture indicator not been there, certainly that's not how they would have written automatic and 200 on this watch. It's just not necessarily the, the cleanest design choice. It uses up the space quite a bit. It adds a little bit of a little bit of a distraction to the dial, frankly. And so I'm, I'm a little bit torn. I feel like that's one of those elements that is almost playing a little too closely to the TR900 uh, and didn't necessarily need to be there. Maybe it's something that would have found on one edition of the watch, but a, a version of this watch could have been made with just out that. Maybe that's coming in the future. I, I definitely don't know. But that's the one thing that I kind of go back to wishing wasn't necessarily there. That just feels a bit like a, a visual distraction, frankly. In terms of the hands, you have fence posts, hour and minute hands. These are straight to the mill spec. I quite like these hands. They feel nice and different from what you'd see on a civilian dive watch, you know, if you think about like a plow prof or something like that, which kind of, you know, was big and dramatic. These are much more straightforward and military feeling. The minute hand in particular has a little bit of a split in the middle. So at night, when you're looking at the loom, you have two blocks of loom. So it's very easy to just quickly at a glance, recognize what the hour is and what the minute is. Uh, the second hand uh, is then just sort of an elegant hand with a long arrow pointed tip. This is a very sharply executed dial as you would expect on a modern watch. But, you know, I feel like Mark II really has a high, high sense of um, quality control and uh, attention to detail, and you can definitely see it here. As mentioned before, uh, inside of the Tornek Ravel is the Seiko NE15C movement. This is an automatic movement with 24 joules, 21,600 beats per hour, and a 50 hour power reserve. Uh, it's basically the uh, OEM version of the 6R15 movement, which you know has been in thousands and thousands of Seiko dive watches. It's a, watch you're very a movement you're very familiar with. One thing uh, you can be sure of, and the watch actually comes with this, is that it's adjusted in-house and the watch comes with a document showing you how it has been adjusted. So the Tornek Ravel standard is higher than the kind of out of the factory standard. And once again, if you're familiar with Bill Yao and Mark II's work, 
you'll know that uh, this is something that they really care about. So you're gonna get a well-adjusted, well-timed watch. Now let's take a look at the TR660 on the wrist. TR660 comes with two strap options, uh, as mentioned before. This is the Nitex nylon strap, type 1-M2. This is a strap of their own. Development is based on a mil spec from the 60s, and it's essentially a, a nylon strap with a very heavy weave to it and a very heavy pattern. Um, it's extremely attractive in my opinion, and it comes in two colors, black or the khaki, which you see here. And this is sort of uh, an interesting khaki that rides between beige and sort of pea green, kind of British khaki. So it's, it's, it's actually quite a nice color in person. It's, it's a very nice strap. It is a tiny bit under 20 millimeters. So I do see the spring bars on occasion, which I don't love. And it's a little bit tense. It, it, sometimes I find it to be a little irritating after, after a full day of wear. It's not like a soft strap, but that could break in over time. But now let's like just talk about this on the wrist. So as I said before, it's a 40 millimeter watch that fits my seven inch wrist. I think perfectly. It's not too long lug to lug at 48.5 millimeters, so it doesn't overhang. It's not a very like curvaceous watch. As said before, it is this kind of a harsh slab design. It doesn't really like hug the wrist either. The lugs don't conform to the wrist either. And it is a bit tall, certainly at 14.7 millimeters, and then even taller when on a strap that, you know, a pass-through strap that goes underneath it. The result there, and you know, it is uh, winter while I'm reviewing this, or fall winter, uh, is that underneath a shirt sleeve, underneath a heavy jacket, it's definitely something I noticed. It kind of caught the jacket. So that is, you know, kind of annoying, but that's just the reality of a sort of a thick slab sided dive watch, particularly one with like kind of a 90 degree bezel on it here. So it's those little things I was kind of saying before, like they give it that aesthetic, um, but they're not necessarily like the best choices for the most comfortable, easy wearing watch. That said, like a lot of other vintage inspired dive watches, a lot of military inspired watches, you're not necessarily buying this for its ergonomics. I mean, this is a watch that is incredibly good looking if you like the look of it. And I think the execution is just well done here. I mean, it's just such a nice, perfect gray. The bezel is beautiful. The dial is really clear. It's very conservatively and like executed. There's no extra flares except for maybe that little circle on the dial, but even that you don't see from a distance or anything. So who is this watch for? I think it's for people who are fans of vintage military watches, vintage dive watches. Certainly if you've uh, appreciated the look of a 50 Fathoms, 50 Fathoms of the modern day is a very expensive luxury watch. I believe, you know, they start high four figures and easily go into the five figures. So that might not be the watch for you. It's not the watch for me. And it's not really at this point kind of a tool watch. And I think what Torneck Ravel really wanted to get across is that this is still a functional tool watch. The other reality is that uh, if you really like a Torneck Ravel, the TR900 is not a watch you're really ever going to get. I mean, there's only a handful of them left. They go to for five or six figures at auction. And uh, if you do have one, uh, chances are you're not gonna take it into the pool. So this is a better way of getting Tornick Ravel on your wrist at this point in time. But it's also not your only option for something in this style. The Helsin Skin Diver I reviewed years ago uh, is uh, still uh, you know, a nice 50 Fathoms looking watch and very affordable. I think as far as I can tell, it's still in manufactured. Um, you know, Mark II occasionally makes Stingray watches, which are also in the 50 Fathom style. And then more recently, you have uh, the Bull of a Mill ships, which actually has a really similar story that coincides largely with the Tornick Ravel story. And that really goes for a much more precise, you know, look. So there's, there's other options out there for this aesthetic. I think, you know, if you're a Mark II fan, if you want a Tornick Ravel, or if you just really like what this, what ha this has going for it, you know, this is a good one. And, uh, you know, the price is fair. So of course the one challenge to this watch is that uh, they might not be available at this moment. They did sell out really quickly, but should you be waiting for one and uh, are looking forward to it, I think you are gonna be very happy with what you got. And if this is the watch you want, I think it is also worth the wait. If you found this review useful, please like, share, and subscribe. And of course, read the full review on wornandwound.com. Thank you.